The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the third chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so for now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. The voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved One, with whom I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Sisters, brothers, siblings in Christ, grace and peace to you from the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the point where we get to decide whether or not I've forgotten how to preach or not. <laughs> As I return from a much needed sabbatical and try and get back into the swing of things, as we start a new calendar year, and as the dust finally begins to settle from the most recent elections, and the various swearing-in ceremonies take place, <clears throat> it seems fitting that the first topic that we should encounter together is Jesus and his baptism. We are familiar with the setting. John is at the River Jordan calling people to repentance, baptizing them for the forgiveness of sin, when Jesus appears ready to take his turn in the muddy waters. Recognizing Jesus for who he is, which is to say more than simply his cousin, but God's chosen one whom John has been preparing the way for busily all this time. But when the time comes, John balks at baptizing Jesus. I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me, exclaims John. Permit it, commands Jesus, for it is proper for us to fulfill all righteousness. In truth, it all seems highly unusual, not just to John, but to all of us, but even more so than we might realize. God had already chosen, elected, if you will, Jesus to be the Messiah, the Son of God. In coming to John, a prophetic figure if there ever was one, Jesus has presented himself for his swearing-in ceremony, I guess you could say. Just as the prophet Samuel anointed first Saul and then later David as king of Israel, so John is called upon to anoint Jesus. Of course, that makes this all highly, highly unorthodox. Is what makes this all highly unorthodox is that Jesus' anointing doesn't take place in the temple in Jerusalem, in the political, economic, and religious center of power, but in the middle of nowhere. On the banks of a muddy little river, the very same river that the Hebrew people crossed over more than a thousand years earlier as they made their way into the promised land and a fresh start from their time of slavery and wanderings in the wilderness. It was a fresh start, a time to begin anew with a righteousness that was not their own, but a gift from God. That history wasn't the only reason John was out there at the River Jordan. John's preaching out on the fringes of society was also a prophetic critique of the center of power and its economic, religious, and political corruption. John's call to repentance, to turn away from that corruption and begin a new life with a fresh start, brought people flocking to him. People who had been left out sidelined, trampled, demeaned by the religious, political, and economic agents of law and order of the time. The temple, with all its pomp and circumstance, its pageantry and mystique, was awe-inspiring to be sure, but it was also no mystery that those with the power had set up a religious, political, and economic system that kept people trapped on a treadmill of guilt and shame and forcing them to pay for the privilege of God's forgiveness and righteousness. 
God's prophet John, however, had the temerity to challenge that system, to proclaim that God's love and grace were as free and as abundant as the water flowing in the River Jordan, the biggest river in all of Israel. Now, some scribes and Pharisees made the trek out to see John, regardless of whether they were there to take John up on his offer or simply to be spies for the powers that be back in Jerusalem. They were, regardless, beneficiaries of the system that poisoned the world and its relationship with God. And so John called them a brood of vipers. As such, when Jesus was inaugurated at his baptism through the water and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, divinely affirming Jesus' identity as the Son of God, the Beloved One, Jesus made it perfectly clear what the focus of his ministry was going to be. It was going to be the fulfillment, the realization of all righteousness. Everything would be made new again. Jesus' goal as God's duly anointed Messiah was to bring about a restoration of all of a right relationship among God, all people, all tribes and nations, and all of creation. Jesus did not have a little dream. In fact, he had the biggest of the big dreams, and he called it the reign of God. Excuse me, the reign of heaven. This is Matthew. This mission, of course, was not without its detractors. Jesus knew that there was going to be opposition, pushback, sabotage. People who have power and privilege try desperately to protect it and to thwart real change. If there weren't pushback, it would have meant that Jesus wasn't really actually bringing about real change in the system, but merely rearranging the furniture in the temple. At the same time, at his baptism, Jesus didn't say, it is proper for me, nor did he say, it is proper for you, John, to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus said, it is proper for us, which is more than Jesus and John, because Jesus also then went on to call disciples to help him carry on this mission of realizing all righteousness. Through our baptisms, we too have been called as disciples of Jesus into the way of all righteousness. We are citizens of the reign of heaven, and we seek the healing of all relationships, which is a, if not the, central role of the church, the community of believers who labor in the fields of the world, sowing the seed of Jesus' gospel good news. To each of us and to the whole world, Jesus says, rejoice, for the reign of heaven has come near. God's love and grace flow freely and abundantly from the throne of God. Repent. Let go of, that, of your pursuit of the old worldly power and privileges, the love of money and reputation. That system only serves to benefit a few while dehumanizing the rest. And what good will it do you when the last shall be made first and many who are first shall be made last? Believe in this good news. Believe that real righteousness and not relative righteousness has won the day. I have called you, my beloved ones, to take up your crosses and follow me in the way of righteousness. For that, that is your real inheritance. Oh, there will be resistance. You can count on that. But fear not. For just as the resistance crucified me, I also rose from the dead. The reign of heaven persists, and nothing can stop me from bringing you to true righteousness with God, one another, and all of creation. Amen. Amen.